Hello and a very warm welcome to another conversation about life and change and decisions and how life sometimes throws you a curveball and you must just handle it. And our guest today is Jonathan Kaplan, who's seen his share of that kind of uh, both physical and, and uh, metaphorical balls come your way. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, you were, you at one point held the record for the most test matches that any referee had, had ever, how does one say it in English? In Afrikaans we say, je blaas die wedstrijd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you say that in English, he blew the game, it doesn't sound the best. Yeah, um, I had a very long career. Um, 17 years. 17 year international career, just under. And, and I, you know, at one stage I did hold the record for the most test caps as a referee, which I moved from 46 when I broke Paul Honus's record to 70 when I set my benchmark. And then that's subsequently been passed by Nigel Owens and I think Wayne Barnes as well. And it's, it's good that these records do get broken because they don't really belong to the individual, mm. they belong to the game. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, every rugby lover in South Africa and internationally, of course, knows you and you may also know the book and uh, this wonderful picture on the cover it's it's just such a it catches so so much captures so much yeah yeah what I, was it like to publish this to to have your story out there it, it was quite different you know I, it was one of the projects that i embarked on towards the end of my career mm. uh, you know people ask why are you writing a, a book and for me the the thing was i wanted to write my own story i didn't want somebody else to write my story for me and I felt that it would add to legacy rather than detract from it. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of interesting stories. I've tried to be in the book, which is my style, to be as truthful as possible without, you know, skirting around issues which may be uh, politically sensitive mm -hmm. or where somebody is involved and I'm not comfortable with them as a person. So, you know, most of the book is, is a is a chronology so it's like a time-based chronology until the time that I retire mm. and and then looking forward into where I am possibly at mm. the moment or even down the track. And the, the feeling when you when you got the first copy or when you saw it on the shelf? Um, I, c I can focus quite well I mean I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually quite good with the attention to detail and, but I must say the edit process was a killer. Yeah. Like, like to go through things over and over again. I felt like yes. I read the book 70 times as well. Um, I must say I was very proud when it came out because I, I, was, I was proud of the product. I was proud of the way I went about doing it. Mm. But I was even more surprised when the book became a bestseller in 10 days. And you know, it is a refereeing book. It's not a, a World Cup rugby winning book where the Springboks, everybody's mm. supporting the Springboks. I'm just a, a little cog in the machine and I'm proud of my achievements, but I was a little cog in the machine and was able to produce a book which became a bestseller in 10 days and went on to multiply over yeah. time as well. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, the book is, you know, you're not going to find it readily on the shelves, but it is available on, um, you know, most platforms. And When did you know that sport would be your career? You went to, uh, uh, I went to King, King David in Linksfield. Yes. And you started playing, but you also started ref refereeing quite early. Yeah, yeah? It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the story that appears in the book, is how did I get involved? Mm -hmm. And I had my nose broken in a game. My mom took me for x-rays and she said that's the last time, you know, <laughs> she's taking me for x-rays. So she made the call to at the time I was living in Joburg, so she made the call to Ellis Park to say, which is now Coca-Cola Park or Emirates Park or whatever, <laughs> I go through multiple changes, uh, to say I've got, you know, I'm interested, to, where do I find out how to become a ref? And the lady on the line said, oh, no, they don't accept women referees. So she said, no, it's not for her, it's for her son. How old is her son? He's 17. No, he's too young, but my mom doesn't really take no for an answer. So she pushed a little bit harder and eventually the lady said, look, you can come to one of the meetings and meet Gert Bezodno, who was the test referee at the time, the preeminent test referee at the time. And he was very nice to me. He sort of took me under his wing. He realized... How did you experience that? I mean, um, did you want to do it? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, was, I was happy to be involved. You know, I realized quite soon, really, that I'm not... I don't like the routine of gym. So, you know, doing bench press or curls repetitively. It's not really what I like. I, I'm, I like something a little bit more artistic, a little bit more fluid, creative. And I think in that respect, I felt a bit limited. Plus, I'd been exposed in seconds and thirds to 
an environment which I didn't feel comfortable with. I, I was happy to be involved in rugby in an on-field administrative role. I sort of found my niche, mm. or it was found for me. And uh, right from the beginning, you know, I refed uh, Witz, Old Boys and Kempton Park, uh, uh, fourths of the two clubs. And after the, during the game, I, I could see that they were, they were old men. They were double my age, most of them, at least. And they tried to help me through the game. They were very uh, compassionate towards me. And I was probably running around like a chicken without a head, you know, trying to be important, but also trying to let them play. And after the game, as I was getting my assessment from the bloke that had come to watch me, the hooker of uh, Witz came, he interrupted the meeting and he said, I just want to tell you you're the best ref we've ever had and you must continue with it. So it sort of uh, stopped the assessor in his tracks a little bit. And um, I mean, I, I knew from the beginning that I could do the work. I, I mean, I, I, know, I know this sounds arrogant, but uh, better than anybody else. And it was just a matter of me proving it to every, all the other people that I needed to. I mean, I had a feeling inside me that this would be, I didn't know that it could become a career or that I could earn money from it, but certainly as a hobby, mm. um, I knew I could achieve whatever the highest ranking was. And then you, you went to UCT for economics and philosophy? No, uh, psychology. Psychology. Yeah. And uh, what we said earlier, what were you thinking? Yeah. But it's a serious question. Why did you choose that? Um, I actually started off doing uh, business science and I didn't like the statistics side of the degree. Mm. And so I morphed it into something which I did like, which was, I didn't mind economics. I found some parts of economics actually very interesting. Um, and then I, I thought I'd add another, you know, bow, an arrow to my bow, so, so to speak, to get psychology, which was my genuine interest um, as an undergrad and potentially kick on afterwards. I, I didn't, uh, fortunately, I think, but I'm very, it's like a realm that I'm interested in. I'm interested in all esoterics and pursued astrology as a hobby afterwards, you know, as, as one so of the So it was the classic, uh, let's just do a first degree, uh, the discipline of learning, etc., etc., without really a very clear idea in mind of where it would take you. Yeah. But then you did um, management, you did a master's Ma market, in... Ma I did an honours in marketing management. Honours in marketing management. Yeah, from UNISA. Why uh, did you do that? Um, I felt like I needed to get something else do something else, not just have that undergrad. And I, you know, marketing was as general as I could find. Um, in hindsight, I mean, there were four years well spent for me. Uh, you know, culturally, I picked up a lot uh, from mixing with different people. Um, and I'm happy I went to the institution that was UCT at the time and then had a different way of learning through UNISA, where mm. a lot of it is, is, is up to you. Mm. Um, I squashed that two year course into one year and I and I did the psychology as well so you know in many respects I was, but did it give me the ammunition to go out into the workplace and and with an with a specific skill uh, no it didn't so it's a general skill you need the you know confidence and obviously market yourself as well as you market uh, product but you know the marketing field was not really for me as I found out in time could you make refereeing a career? Did it, was it not at, enough of a, of, I mean, did it give you enough income? No, not at that time. It was pure hobby. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, I don't even know if we were getting paid petrol money at the time. I think we just got paid like a, a tiny match fee, which was not, not, it wasn't money that could get you through a meal almost. So, um, yeah, it was, it was just a hobby, but it was something, you know, in life you hold on to certain things that resonate with you. And that was one of the things I was never going to let go of it. I started road running as a hobby to try and get fit for rugby. And I found that it, it actually, I loved it. So I carried on with road running until eventually the rugby aficionado said to me, listen, you've got to choose one or the other. Because, I mean, it, it's an interesting story. It's not well published, but uh, I ran Comrades in 1996, I think it was. And I was... I was just breaking through onto the Curry Cup arena and referees, and I ran it on the Monday, it was always on the 31st of May, and I got a call on Tuesday morning from uh, Freak Berger to say that Tupper Henning and Ian Rogers had been put on ice because of some allegedly poor performance, and I'd been given this game on Saturday between Free State and the Bulls in Bloom. Uh, would I like it? So I said, yeah, absolutely, I'm, like, uh, I'm dead keen. And when I put the phone down, the next phone, I normally would have phoned my family to say, look at me. 
And uh, I phoned the physio, this friend of mine, James Fleming, and I said, listen, I, I hope you've got a lot of drugs. My legs are hell of a sore and I'm refing this Curry Cup game on Saturday and I can't get out of second gear at the moment. So anyway, it was a process to try and get the lactic acid out of my legs and fortunately I'd recovered by the Saturday. So in that sense, physically you had to choose. It I did. I did too I did. hard on your body. Yeah, well, I was doing a lot of long distance stuff yes. and I was, I was pretty committed. So yeah, they were right. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was happy to, uh, to let running take a back seat and um, and, and when my career started to finish as a ref, not just as a professional, but you know, I retired in, in 2002, I'd started already to explore uh, road running as a, you know, that hobby that I enjoyed. And I, you know, I, I came full circle. I got my um, Two Oceans blue number and I got my comrades green number. So it was it's a beautiful, beautiful story. After 17 years and um, the, being so much a part of that world, Tell me about the decision to retire. Um, yeah, you know, it, it was very tough at the time. You know, I rugby. I had an imbalance in my life. Rugby was. It, it meant so much to me that it wasn't just, you know, a check at the end of the month. It was a labour of love. I actually loved. I'm not sure everybody loved my product, but you know, for the most part, that's why I was there because I was good at what I did, and for the most part, appreciated for it. But there comes a time when everyone's got to go and it was a little bit, I was pushed a little bit by um, the powers that be at World Rugby, the RB at the time. And I was very Why? upset because about it. What was the argument? Kind of new blood needed? Yeah, yeah, kind of thing. yeah. It was basically, look, uh, you're coming to the end of the road, whether it's this year, next year or the year after. Uh, we feel that, you know, the timing is more or less right. So I went to the World Cup. I was a bit disappointed that I didn't kick on to do a semi or a you know, quarter semi final, third and fourth, something like that. I know I was earmarked for that, but for whatever reason it didn't happen. And then I was told, uh, this is your last game, take it or leave it. And I'd actually dislocated my shoulder. I'd, I'd ripped my bicep tendon off the bone and, it, and subluxed my shoulder during a game uh, between uh, Italy and Ireland. And it was searing pain. But I thought to myself, if this is my last game, they're going to have to carry me off the field because I must finish what I started. So I, I you know, waded my way through the game and, um, and I finished. And it was disappointing. You know, there were guys that were older than me that were mm -hmm. st still on the panel, much less decorated in terms of their achievements. But the management at the time had an idea of what they wanted going forward and I wasn't part of their plans. So as hard as it was for me to accept, there was nothing I could do. So I carried on with Super Rugby for a couple of years and then decided that it was as good a time as any. And what did you do career-wise? What was the next step? Well, actually the book was, the book started to take a lot of my time. So to, to get a product out that wasn't just, you know, regurgitating some, some of my interests, but, you know, I got an author, this guy Mike Burr in, and he hadn't written a book before, but what I liked about him is that he almost didn't know the domain well enough. So whenever I told him a story and he said, hang on, that's got to go in, I was like, no, that is so mundane. He was, that's going in the yeah. book. Yeah. So, you know, I did a bit of the book. I worked as brand ambassador for a few organizations, most notably FNB, uh, worked for Surtec for a bit. Um, I, did, I got onto the, the speaking circuit, which is quite good money for a, mm. for a short uh, time. Um, it lasted for, I mean, I still do a bit of it now, but it's not nearly as much as it was because obviously if you don't have a, a public footprint, you know, media, social media, um, TV, it's quite difficult to get um, appointments. And we have to call a spade a spade. I'm a referee, not a, you know, not a coach or a player. And so people, I think, want to hear more from the main man, which is, which, which are those people. Mm. But I did a bit of that. I, I've got uh, passive income from some properties. Mm. and I'd, So what's yeah. your advice? You know, a career like this, whether you the ref or one of the players, it's based on your physical capacity and that will go down. Yeah. So it has a limited lifespan. Yeah. What's your advice to young people getting into sport as a career? Um, I think it's fantastic. I think it's a, it's a, it's a golden egg. Mm. And, and I think they should be aware of the pitfalls, that only the best will make it, um, but that if they do make it, there is still a limited time. So for those that try and fail, it's not actually the end of the world because they are, they are younger, so they can still get into the marketplace. For those that uh, keep trying and plugging along until eventually it fails, whether it's in their 30s or in their 40s, late 40s like me, um, at some stage it's going to end, and there's got to be some 
uh, planning for that rainy day. And when I say rainy day, I like rainy days, so I don't, I, you know, I'm not portraying it as a, as a sad thing. But because there must be a long-term a long term vision, a long-term plan. Yeah, 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 and you've got to be planning while you're busy riding the wave. You know, if you, you're riding an amazing wave and everybody's loving you, you've still got to be planning for the time where they're not. Mm -hmm. And it can change quite quickly, as, as I alluded to earlier. Um, but but in, in, you know, in my case, I actually, it allowed me, because I was on the road, for the better part of two and a half decades, flying an average of 100 flights a year, being away from home for probably about an average of 150 to 180 days every year. When I, when I did, you know, get the knock on the door to say it's your, your time is done, it actually allowed me to focus on whatever was my next project in inverted commas, because it's not really a project, it's almost like a life dream to have a family and, and children. And so the one, it was almost seamless that the one, the, the death of the one uh, something that was that important to me um, enabled me to move into something which was actually more important in, yeah. uh, you know, at the end yeah, of the well, day. Because uh, that is actually, if, you know, your name has become synonymous with something else now, something which is very different. And uh, again, there's a, a wonderful book. Um, you just decided, I want to be a dad, whether you had a, a, a partner in the picture or not. Uh, that's quite radical for a man. Did you always know that you want children? Yeah. So, so it wasn't that I decided that I want children. I'd always I'd made the decision from as long as I can remember. Really? Yeah. I always wanted children, but yeah. perhaps uh, because of my lifestyle, my yeah. career, perhaps because of my character. I mean, I, we can't discount that. Um, perhaps circumstantially, perhaps I just my design may be different. I never met the right person up until whenever, uh, you know, I never settled down really. And eventually when I got to the end of that career as a professional, I uh, decided, well, this is as good a time as any. I, somewhere along the line, some consciousness came towards me that there was a different way of doing things. I mean, I always grew up like, a, you know, I'm going to get married, have four children, live happily ever after. So I was always like exposed to the biblical way or the Hollywood way of that things could or the way they should work out. Sometimes they don't. For, for many people. So was, how did you set about that? You, you said, I, a man, want a baby. You need a woman in the picture. So how did you go about that? So I, I was sort of ending it with, a, with this um, girl that I had been dating through most of 2013. It was basically going nowhere. So I decided that I'll explore this option of surrogacy. And I went to, I phoned uh, a friend, uh, an acquaintance that happened to go to a school of mine in Durban, uh, a gay guy who had had twins through the process. And he said to me, Listen, I asked him, you're going to tell me in a nutshell, should I do it, yes or no? What's been fantastic about the process and what are the pitfalls? He gave it to me in five minutes with an emphatic stamp of, yes, you do it. Uh, so I phoned up a, a, an agency, a donor agency, which is the first step. And I said, look, I'm a, I'm a single straight guy, but I'm interested in doing this. Uh, can we meet? Yes, we can, but you know, everything's closing down and it's December. So I said, look, the meeting is not closing down. Let's have the meeting and let's have it. And, and actually the, the girl that I spoke to uh, from this agency, she, she said in the book that it was quite disconcerting that I was so certain that I wanted to do it because normally she has to give information, you know, th these are the costs mm. and this is what you're in for and you need this amount of time and, um, you know, are you sure that, you, do you want to think about it for a few weeks? And I was like, no, I'm doing it. So whether I do it with you or somebody else, I'm doing it. What does this agency do? I didn't know such things existed. Yeah, no, no, so, th so they're a donor agency, so uh, young women come into the agency to, to donate or potentially donate their eggs for a variety of reasons. Surrogacy, uh, you know, being my pathway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, so as, as a potential recipient, an intended parent, it's called IP, you go onto the website, you log in your details, and then you can go and, and see who you would like to reserve uh, for this process. Um, if they're available, then they go through the process of getting um, 
uh, for, uh, you know, get, taking a few yeah. drugs to, to make sure that they can produce hormone treatment. Hormone and so treatment. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So there are <coughs> people who just want to donate eggs, and then there are people who actually say, "I would be willing to be a surrogate yes. mother so, to yes. carry a baby." Yes, and and more more often than not, they're two separate yeah, uh, pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. In between that is also the legal uh, the legal side of things. We have to get a rubber stamp by the High Court to say that this baby belongs to you and only you. Oh. And uh, that's a process which takes a few months and, and that's not cheap either. And then, and then once that is rubber stamped, then you've got your surrogate, you've got your donor and you've got your intended parent. And then you go forward through to a fertility clinic and they put all the pieces together. And you know, from gun to tape, my, with my son Caleb, it took two and a half years from the time that I started the process. It's a long process. pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, you, did you meet the surrogate mother? Did you build any relationship? Um, yes, I did. And, and I'm not usually one that's lost, you know, lost for words. I can normally think coherently and I'm in tough situations. I can also express myself. But in that, that was a very tricky meeting because here I'm speaking to somebody who's going to carry my child who's going to give me the greatest gift that I could ever receive from anyone, let alone a stranger. And you've got to, you've got to disassociate the fact that she's not your friend, you've never met her, she's not your type for the fact that she's going to be the surrogate. So she's going to provide a healthy environment for your, for your baby. And when I met her, it was, you know, she, she is the most amazing person. I mean, I can say that about her. Uh, she held my hand throughout the process. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, in, in many respects, I was a 16-year-old guy who, who, whose thoughts were around, I want to be a dad, but didn't really know much about the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And she helped me through that whole process until delivery. And the nice ending to that story is that, so her name's Jackie, by the way, and that's all documented in the book. Um, the nice ending to that is that she, it, it's up to me, the intended parent, to decide whether I want to have any relationship going forward, and they know that to start with. And I asked her, what do you want going forward? And she said to me, she'd like to look at him from afar, so sort of on social media, and every now and again meet for coffee. So that's what she got, because she's such a, a genuine person mm -hmm. that there was absolutely no threat to you know, my relationship with my son. And just with the part that you won't know about is that the actual donor, uh, I found her and she found me at a similar time on social media. I can't go into the dynamics of it, but it is the, the mother egg in a way. And um, she's also an amazing person. And, you know, she donated eggs anonymously. We happened to meet. We're not really interested in having a friendship or you know, relationship. She's got on with her life and I'm very happy for her. But she's given me as well mm -hmm. one of the greatest gifts because I, I can tell you now, uh, my son is the most amazing son. What yeah. did you, you didn't feel that immediately when you held him as a, as a baby, did you? What was your immediate response? Yeah, so because I was detached from the process, I mean, like I said, this Jackie tried to help me through the various stages. But I almost felt like I was going to the hospital to get a, a lucky packet, and then and I left the next day. So I, I literally I put a, I, I I got all the food and the dummies and the cot and the compactum and whatever. The whole then list. I, yeah, the list was ticked. Uh, actually, my friends, most of my friends' wives or my friends themselves, actually had a um, a party. What do you call that party where they? Give you all presents and things, uh, yeah, kind uh, of for, but it's normally for women. Party, a stork yeah. party, and you and yeah. you have sponge cake and tea, and, and <laughs> my, mine was a little bit different. I had tequila, and you know, I was, uh, I was having a big party. But well, anyway, you they, could drink. You were not pregnant. Exactly, exactly. It was completely different. So, so you know, I needed a car seat, and I needed somebody to help me because the, you know the head lolls around a bit. So I had to drive from the hospital back to my house. And uh, that's the way I felt. I went in there, I stayed the night. The, the nurses showed me how to feed, not to be worried. I mean, in the beginning, it's like, you know, the, the black stuff that comes out. And they just basically filled me in on a few things and helped me through the, that initial process. But I was, you know, I didn't feel um, attached to myself. I thought, you know, some of my friends have said to me, this is the greatest day of your life, you'll love it. It's a, but when I was there, I didn't feel like that. So I wasn't, uh, you know, it was almost disappointment. It wasn't like, uh, uh, you know, I can't believe that I've done this or I'm so disappointed. It was like, look, I'm sure it'll come down the track, but at the moment, I'm not feeling it. Mm. 
Mm. So I had that It's just uh, body. a job I have to do now. Well, I subsequently found out that it's not that unusual, this feeling of mm. detachment. Mm. And it comes in time. And my trigger, the time that I... Fell in love. Yeah, basically, <laughs> is the first time that he smiled. Because that's the first time that I could see he was actually recognizing me. He yes. probably recognized me before but couldn't express. Yeah. But this was the first time, you know, after about six weeks, that and it was July was the 8th, that there was a connection. Like I could see that he knew me. Mm. And then from then onwards, and it's, it's only got better and, mm. and only got easier as well. You uh, put him out there on social media to quite a large extent. Um, is that a choice? Why do you do that? Is um, it because you want to share or is there a different... No, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, was, I was very proud of myself. I was, I was very chuffed that I had a son. Yes. Uh, 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 I was very chuffed that I had offspring and, yes. and a son, I happened to yeah. be. Um, the, the thing really for me was about, I, I think it's an amazing gift to give somebody, to give your, your son in this case, uh, um, yeah, I'll use the same word again, a chronology of their life before they're able to document it themselves. Mm. And so in time where he's, uh, we, we, and this is in effect a scrapbook, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a more thorough scrapbook. So I'm, I'm adding comments, people are adding comments. So it's his life going forward from now and eventually he can take over. I mean, I don't know if, if Instagram's going to be around yeah, uh, forever, similar. but I can, mm. I, I've got those, um, you know, that I've got that documented and whenever he wants, he can carry on and it's his life. And, and I think if I could look back on some of the stuff that I've forgotten or some of the stuff that I never knew, I think it would enrich my life. It would enhance my life that I knew who, uh, who my, I mean, that, that I, I, I was fortunate that I could, but some people don't know, never know who their granny was, never know who their grandpa was. Some, in some cases, terrible guy, they don't know who their father was. So I, th I think th that was a strong reason behind it. You're not worried about the publicness? No. That it is out there for everyone? No, I actually, it's fine. Th there's nothing hidden in, the, in either the process or the outcome because he's a, he's a uh, I mean, look, he's, he's not exactly got uh, three million followers. There, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's probably, um, I think it's around about 1,300 people mm. that are interested in this little boy's life. Mm. And if it drops to 10 people, it's also okay. I'm not, I'm not looking for, mm. uh, to promote him in a way. I'm just, th this is a documentation of his life. Sometimes I like to go back and see how it was on day one, that, that day of wonder. Um, you know, the next day when I've taken a photo of him mm. leaving hospital, he's got a bit of jaundice. The next day, you know, in his first outfit until, you know, you can just see it. So yeah. I, I think it's beautiful. I like going backwards in time and reminiscing. Why did you decide to write this book, Winging It? Um, so Winging It is a very apt title because, like I said, I, in many respects, I was a 16-year-old. Yeah, well, no one gets training to be a parent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so why did I do it is because of what you said initially that I was a, a single straight guy uh, following a different pathway and I, I had hundreds of people, perhaps thousands, uh, interested in how I'd gone about the process that contacted me privately, contacted me on my social media, on my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter to say this is amazing, we never knew this existed. I never knew it existed. I'm not, I'm not a guru, I'm in fact the guinea pig but what the book attempts to do is to highlight um, the process involved uh, f in the form of my own story mm. and it's got a real twist in the tail like I said I actually ended up meeting the the donor which was a uh, unheard of it's mm. it's actually quite unusual and for me was was a fantastic experience because there is a curiosity about where did this come from mm. and I'm very happy that she was willing to be a, a, a part of my life in, in inverted commas I mean like that, you know, in the back seat, and, and also that she was willing to uh, participate in, mm. the, in the writing be of this book. Because, it, yeah. like I said, mm. this book is not definitive. This is not a definitive, this is a storyline yeah. yeah. of what is possible if you explore different pathways. You want a child, so you explore all your pathways. If this is for you, then read the book, because the book will, will highlight all the ups and downs of the, of the process. And uh, you've brought someone, you now have someone in your life more permanently than you, it seems you ever had before. Yeah. Susan. Yeah. You met her where and when? And how? I, I've, I'd know, and I've met how, her through a common friend. Um, how did you know that this might actually last? I didn't, like, mm. like all the others. You know, you, you go down the road of uh, being hopeful. <laughs> but but uh, I'm, 
Um, so basically, I'd met Susan before, um, you know, just socially, and then I, uh, she runs as well, I run, so we, we're part of a similar group. I'd been dating somebody else at the time, it didn't work out for, for whatever reason, and, you know, it, uh, maybe eight months after Caleb was born, I started um, dating Susan, and we're still going. We're uh, 31 months on Sunday. <laughs> The 4th of August, so something's, something's happening. And what makes it work this time around? Um, it's a good question. It could be, it could be that this is the, the right person, that, that, mm -hmm. that I finally found somebody that, um, you know, that I can make a home with. Do you feel that you may be giving something slightly different? And not because of a conscious decision, but just because of the relation, how it works? Yeah, you know, there was a time where I started to think I'm, I'm perhaps it's me, perhaps I'm not marriage material. You know, it's not like a, uh, and I still don't know the answer to this. It, it, like I said to you earlier, it could have been my career, it could have been me, mm. it could have been my character, it could have been a flaw, it could be a, a positive thing, who knows. Um, you know, I don't look at marriage as something that I need to tick to say I've mm. lived a good life. Whereas the children thing were, was something that I wanted to experience. I wanted to experience the love of a dad and being able to give love back as a dad. With a, with a, I had many girlfriends, I had many relationships, they're all beautiful, they all had, had uh, end points, uh, and in some cases they had end points as relationships, but uh, as uh, girlfriends, but then carried on as friends. It's all good, that's, mm. that's life. For me, I, you know, I'm happy that I've finally found somebody that uh, I think could be uh, the future. Um, but you're asking me what crucial ingredient it is, I, I don't know what crucial ingredient yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, you know, we were talking about it the other day. What we've been through as a couple is, is pretty amazing. And the, the fact that we are here now, ha after having gone through all of that, and not least of all, you know, maybe this is one of your questions or maybe it isn't, but, I'm, you know, she, she's had to experience uh, me going through these surrogacies when she's uh, around and available as well. So it, it, we've been through a lot of difficult processes, decisions, mm -hmm. You know, we, we always seem to get through the other side with a love for each other mm. um, long may it continue. Respect and openness. Yeah. How, what was it like to introduce another person into your relationship with Caleb? Um, not that difficult in, in, in respect of Susan because uh, she's a very good, she's a natural mother, mm. so she, she's good with that. Uh, she treated Caleb as one of her own and she uh, you has know, she's, two kids. Yeah, she's got two beautiful daughters. Mm. Uh, who also, I must say, have contributed. You know, you talk about how was it to introduce this person, but I come from a broken home, and I know that one of the difficulties is not this person only, it's their offspring as well. So how do, how do those relate? And very fortunately, there's been a, a beautiful liaison between my son and, and her two daughters. They are teenagers? No, no, they're eight and nine, oh, uh, okay. Sinead and Zara. Mm. Um, yeah, they. I, I couldn't imagine uh, sisters, real sisters, doing a better job than they've done with my son. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But then you, you have something very special to share today, and that yeah. is that Caleb actually has real sisters. Yeah. So I carried on with the surrogacy uh, program. Um, I actually tried to get a full, uh, full, full sibling a fully related sibling, so the same donor. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, so I've had to go a different pathway, and, and that in itself is not bad. And I uh, had to get a different surrogate, a different process going. How old was Caleb when you started this, the second round? Oh, no, he was... I'd already had the thought in my head that I, that I want a sibling for him. I, I grew up, uh, like I said, in a broken home, and I grew up living on my own for a while and living with my f brothers, and I, I loved the living with my brothers more than I love being on my own. So, so you didn't want an on, only child? If that was, if, if that was, if, yeah. if possible. Yeah. If, I was grateful to have yes. my son, but yeah. if I could yeah. go along the pathway to get a sibling, which is what I did, um, and I needed to do it so, sooner rather than later because I'm 52 now. Um, yeah, so uh, the surrogate fell pregnant. She fell pregnant with twin, uh, twins. Uh, twin girls. It's the first girls. We had nine boys in my family in a row, and then uh, now we've all got these two girls. So, yeah, it's very exciting. What did, they were what born did this you think, feel when you heard that you were going to have two instead of one? I must say, like, 
I was completely shocked. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I remember at the screening, you do these screenings in the, uh, yeah, in so the clinics, yeah. and I was holding a cup of coffee and, you know, the, the doctor showed me, okay, yeah, this one is going to work. I had a lot of bad luck actually before mm -hmm. Caleb. And, and, and in a roundabout way, I'm actually grateful that I had that bad luck because I've ended up with the best son that, that one can imagine. But, you know, at the time I was very frustrated. I probably said things I shouldn't have said, but it was just one of those things like you get to like boiling point. Um, you know, he was looking around and said, that, this one is going to work, Jonathan. This is a beautiful heartbeat. It was a very strong uh, blastocyst, which is the embryo that they stick inside. And it is going to work. And I was so chuffed with myself that this was finally going to happen. And then he moved it around a little bit. He said, look, there's another heartbeat over there, also very strong. And I reversed into the wall <laughs> with my coffee. And I remember, I, th I thought I was stuck to the wall. Like, uh, you know, and he said, no, you come back. This is a normal reaction. You know, even people who prepare for it, yeah. it's, it is a shock. And yeah. I, I think I was in shock for about two or three weeks mm. afterwards, maybe a bit longer. Um, but, but like I've said from the beginning, you know, and I'm, and I'm really, I am under pressure at the moment, but children are a blessing and, and I've never lost uh, that theme, that idea. Um, and I, you know, the one thing about these, uh, the, these twin girls that were born on Valentine's Day is that, um, you know, it's not just a thing of, of ticking a box or having children, it's like I need to be the best father that I can be to them. And that that's, takes incredible resolve because it's not an easy job and everyone knows it's not an easy job. And as much as Susan is part of my life and she's, and she, you know, she's great. And my mom, by the way, who, mm. um, who lived here, you know, up until a couple of months ago, she's, uh, she's also been fantastic for me as a great default when I needed to do something for myself mm. or Susan and I needed mm. to do something for us. My mom would take care of it. One needs a, a support network. You can't be a parent on your own. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I, it wasn't just, I'm, I'm telling you the main players. I've had mm. a lot of people mm. Um, that have helped with, with similar, uh, similar things like, you know, I need to go out, want to see a movie. I haven't seen a movie, I haven't been to a movie house for six months. Let's go see a movie. Yeah. Oh, hang on. There's a couple of things we've got to take care of. Yeah. So uh, I've got lots of friends that help. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's and what's it like to now have three little people? I'm under the pump. I mean, I make no bones about it. It is, it is very difficult. You know, as much as when, when Caleb was born, I used to scream out of the house when the nanny came in in the morning to have a cup of coffee or two or three uh, just to unwind. It, it was like I had cabin fever. Mm -hmm. And so now I've made it uh, doubly or triply um, mm -hmm. as challenging. But I know in time that this will pass and I've ended up with uh, three beautiful uh, children. And I do think that I did contract uh, spiritually to bring these um, souls into the world. And, and I've done it. And and it was a contract that we had somewhere out there. So I'm, I'm very happy that I've brought them in. And like I said, my role for as long as I'm still alive is to give them all the um, necessary stuff to allow them to be the best people they can be. What, is, what are the, the kind of values and what's the basic building block that you want to give them, to empower uh, them? Well, I think from my... Uh, you know, so, so I, like I said, come from a broken home. So from my dad's side, not that he didn't give love, he did, but, you know, he gave me the work ethic. He gave me the thing of discipline, you know, roll your sleeves up. Sometimes life gets challenging. Mm. It doesn't always work out well. It doesn't always work out the best, you know, changing course and things like that. My dad uh, responsibility tried to... Responsibility also, responsibi taking the responsibility. Correct. So he provided me with all those things that, mm. uh, you know, that some people could take for granted, but which I don't. And then my mom was, uh, was almost like the love component. Mm. So that nurturing, soft landing love component that made me feel like I was Superman. Mm. So, so no, honestly, like, so, so I, had a, I had a very successful career as a referee. Yeah. And, and I'm very uh, grateful for all the people that helped me along the way. And I, and I probably have it in my character to do that work very well. But the person who brought it out the most was my mother because mm. I honestly did feel like there was nobody better than me. And I don't think that that's arrogant. I think that's got to do with the oh, fact that, so important. that I had it's so much love. such a gift for a child. Yeah, I had so much love and so much backing yes. that every time I fell down, and I did, by the way, many times, I had that mother, my mother mostly, but my brothers absolutely, my grandmother, my dad, you know, people helped me when I fell down. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that is the other side of the coin. So if I can provide, so that's, so I'm seeing life through my paradigm, through my, uh, sorry, through my lens. Um, I, I'm hoping that I can provide them with that. And then if I identify things where they are deficient or where they need more, or you know, where I identify something like this is that person's vocation, I'm gonna help them to grow into it. Mm. Uh, that's what I'd like to do. Mm. And uh, the physical space uh, that you need to create, to, to give them that, to be happy yourself, what do you look for in a home? Do you look for light or security or big trees or what? Yeah, so you hit on all those things, funnily enough. I, 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 so, so in the physical sense, I like an airy uh, home with, with a more traditional than a modern feel. Um, a sort of whitewashed walls in, the, in sort of a Greek type of way, but, but it needn't be like, it needs to have air. It needs to have air flowing through it, balcony view. Um, we mentioned trees. I'm a, I, 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 before the drought, I had 60 bonsais. I collect bonsais, it's one of my hobbies. So, you know, it's probably a thing of nurture as well, you know, to make sure mm. that they're functioning well, that they're not dying away. And most of them, up until the drought, I, I actually had a very successful bonsai nursery in a way. And I've still got about uh, just under 30 left that are doing well, I think. Uh, so the tree thing is very important for me. I like that feeling of nature around me. Mm. So if I, can prov if I can have both of those. And then in terms of the, the energy in a house, um, I need both. I need quiet time. I need my little man cave with my books, my programs, my rugby memorabilia, my running medals. I need my space, which is my space. But I also like a busy home with, uh, you know, I've got three bulldogs, which, uh, you know, they're not quiet in any, in any respect. You know, they, they think of sleeping and they start snoring and you can hear it from every room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I like a home that's busy. That's, uh, I like a home that's where there's um, entertainment value for, for my friends. Mm. Well, may you be happy and may you always have a home like that and all of the very, very best with your girls. Thank you and, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. Um, Thank you for I hope I contributed that. Uh, something yes. that uh, people can tag on to in some way or another. I'm sure, yeah. Thank you for watching this, for being with us and good luck with all your plans in your life. Until the next time, goodbye.